On behalf of the Bracken family, I want to thank you for joining us to pay our respects to Genevieve Amelia Bracken. The funeral service began with a family prayer offered by Philip Hodges, a grandfather. We'd like to thank Lindsay Bodley for the beautiful prelude music and also the posted music that's been, that will be provided. I also recognize President Todd Jensen, our stake president on the stand with us, as well as my, I think we'll have my counselors with me, Brady Willardson and Brian Stewart. We'll begin our service. Uh, I also want to recognize and thank uh, Heidi Bick, Bick and Lilas Johnson for being our pianist and chorister today. We'll go ahead and begin our the service by singing hymn 97, Lead Kindly Light. And the opening prayer will be offered by Rachel Larson. Dearest Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be here today to celebrate the life of a beautiful daughter of God and daughter of Chris and Ashley. We're grateful for her life. We're grateful for her beautiful smile that we enjoyed every time we were around her. We're grateful for so many of her good examples of being a good student being a good friend, being a good cousin, and being a great human being to other people. 
We ask as we leave this day that we can carry with us the good memories we have of her and that we can feel her presence around us when it's needed. We ask a special blessing on the whole Bracken family and all of their friends and extended family, everybody who knows that they will find comfort and peace in the way that helps them continue on and to feel thy love that is so needed right now in this day and age. We love thee, Lord, and when we know that you are with us, and that if we just ask, those things that we need will come. <laughs> we ask for these things and say this in the blessed name of our beautiful Savior, Jesus Christ, who has the power to take away all pain and suffering that we are feeling right now. In his name, amen. Thank you, Sister Larson. We'll go ahead and uh, announce the remainder of the program. Um, we'll first hear a life sketch in tribute by Barbara Eubner, Nana, and Jackson Bracken. Following the life sketch of a piano solo, How Great Thou Art, Thou Art, by Jared Tatterton, a family friend. And then Chris and Ashley Bracken will speak to us and following there. Their remarks uh, were asked to show a video presentation by the piano guys and we'll go to that point. Genevieve Amelia Bracken was born September 15, 2007, in Price, Utah, at Castle Valley, Castle Valley Hospital. She was born premature, weighing only seven pounds. Her first solid food was Cheetos, fed her by me, her older brother, at the ripe old age of seven months. <laughs> At 18 months, two very responsible mothers put her on a tube behind the wave runner with a three-year-old in charge. A rogue wave flipped him over, and she was calm and collected and told mom that she saw fishies. <laughs> At two years old, she left home and walked five blocks from home. Someone found her and went door to door trying to find her lost mother. Later that year, she met President President Bush at the Price Airport, where he had just gone back from a hunting trip. She had curly blonde hair until she was three. That day in primary, I had been told to do something nice for my parents. So when mom said she was going to trim Jen's hair after she took a nap, I had an idea. <laughs> A few hours later, mom woke up, and to my surprise, she was not exactly happy. <laughs> <laughs> when we moved houses and her curly hair was no longer on display on the fridge, she decided to cut some, off, cut some more off to replace it with skin, which ended up in another emergency haircut. <laughs> <laughs> when she was potty training, we were at Smith's store in Price. She decided to drop her pants and pee right on the floor of the frozen aisle. <laughs> Dad dropped the weekly newspaper uh, on the ground to soak it up and promptly left the store without telling anyone. <laughs> but clean up on aisle seven. <laughs> We lived in Price, Utah until 2012, when we came 
when we came to teach at Logan at USU. In the summer of 2014, we started our adventure of spending summers in Alaska. Jen caught her first salmon there, but mostly waited for us patiently in the car, captivated by a new book. She wasn't a huge fan of fishing, and offered to stay home or stay at the Chatterton living room. During her time at Sunrise Elementary, she was tied for the youngest person to receive the Barristan Award. That was an accumulation of points earned by reading and testing on many, many books. She was accepted into SEM, an elevated fast-paced learning program for four years. Jen played the cello in fifth grade and became involved with school and community plays such as Robin Hood, Frozen, and a couple other plays over the years. Her favorite class in seventh grade was drama, where she met many people and made a couple of new friends. At 11 years old, she wrote her own church talk with almost no help from mom and dad and delivered it to the congregation easily. I wish I could speak as well as she did. In 2019, while we were in Alaska, she worked at the ice cream shop and loved it. She operated the cash register, scooped ice cream, and got to eat all the ice cream the girl could want. <laughs> she worked there this last summer as well. Two weeks before she passed. Two weeks before she passed, I was able to baptize her for some of our ancestors, the Logan Devil. She loved to read, go to the beach, play with their friends and animals. She also loved SeaWorld and the zoo. Jen was a beautiful, obedient, intelligent sweetheart who achieved 4.0 at school without any product from mom and dad. She was a loyal friend who loved and accepted everyone. She was always there for her friends and family, described her as a loyal friend who loved and accepted anyone she came across. She was always looking for service opportunities for those around her. Genevieve was a quiet old soul who loved books, people, animals, drawing, and creating those intricate little houses she spent countless hours creating. I think we all here love her, and it's going to be a rough few months, but we'll get to this together. Thank you.
Music is one way that really touches my soul. Thank you, Richard. We're going to do a little uh, tag team talk because we know neither of us can make it through. <laughs> um, of course. <laughs> Sweet baby Jenny. She, she hated us calling her that, but we're not really on speaking terms right now. So we're gonna color whatever we want. I don't know that I'd color. I don't know that I would color a daddy's girl. We have some kids that are sixty forty percent, and some that are eighty twenty. But Genevieve would probably be ninety five or more. <laughs> Chris, me. 
just her personalities. Maybe she would wouldn't agree to that. That's probably lower. They're both quiet, deep thinkers, and caring. Being a daddy's girl would imply that she would hang out with him, which was probably true in the early years before we noticed the typical teenager distancing and listening to the headphones. We're grateful for the tender mercies that we received knowing that she's okay. That chaotic. That chaotic morning, the first two songs we heard are the songs we put on the program today. Lead Kindly Light was written about in Chris's journal multiple times. It happened to be the song on Google broadcast that day. We just needed to turn something on to, to add some peace to the home. We were greatly blessed by that. <laughs> During COVID, when our world seemed to be falling apart, music brought peace. Pictures, music, and her burial spot with a, few, a view of the temple, which we'll see you soon, have been some of the tender mercies we've received. We went Saturday to look, and we didn't know where we could find a spot. And we picked, we said this is our favorite spot, and it just happened to be open. And the awesome view down the third, third east of the temple, where we can sit and talk to her. And, and <laughs> and see the temple. Looking back at photos, she had so many pictures in front of the temple. One of our traditions was wherever we went, wherever we were traveling, we would make an effort to try to go by the temple even if we just got up to touch it. Temples, for those of you that don't know, are, are, are special buildings where families can be sealed for the tombs. <laughs> and not just until death do us part. Genevieve was brave. Um, we went sledding in June to Bloomington Lake where the, a long slope of snow led to the frigid water's edge. Genevieve was the only kid that we could remember that got all the way up to the top of the hill and slid down. Got on a sled, slid down the snow and landed in the lake. Very fearless. <laughs> Genevieve, Genevieve is funny. She, uh, we got to look at some of her, go back through some of her books and notes. And um, this, uh, they had the star of the week where each student wrote something why Genevieve was a star. We are really, really grateful for our teachers that make these memories for our kids. That we can read them and have them and cherish them. Multiple students wrote that she was funny. A classmate said, you're funny and creepy in a good way. <laughs> Her sense of humor is a little off sometimes. Most kids said that she was accepting. And another way of her humor, one of my favorite quotes from Genevieve. That was popped when, up yesterday. Was, um, and every time we eat s'mores now, I can't, I think of this quote from her. <laughs> When she was three years old, she said, when wicked people are burned, when Jesus comes, can we have marshmallows? <laughs> Those wicked flavored marshmallows are delicious. <laughs> I, Genevieve was so sweet at the age of eight after looking at the lights at Temple Square. She saw all the homeless people which there are many there. She wanted to make food bags for them. So the next day, we got some chocolate milk, some snacks, and put them in a brown paper bag. And we would walk around and deliver them to the homeless. This became a tradition of ours for the next few years. And each year, it got a little more elaborated, where she would draw them pictures, and we would think of foods they could and couldn't eat, depending on their needs. 
And she reminded me, like it was all her. It was pretty amazing. Um, also in these school papers that we've been able to go through, um, I want to quote Mrs. Hintz, her fourth grade teacher. Jen was a wonderful student who has a heart of gold. She's a very caring friend who works hard to understand people and accepts them for who they are. She includes everyone. She shows others she cares and helps them feel significant. We can all learn from Jen just to love everybody where they are, who they are, no matter what their choices are, just like our Savior loves us. As Jackson mentioned, um, Genevieve was a reader. Um, and, but like me, she hates praise and won't believe people's compliments. She had over 800 SRP, SRC points, those points when you read and take a test, which was double the required amount. Everyone commented on her readings in the notes to her. I remember jokingly telling her, why don't we get out and do something normal today, like play, play video games or eat lots of candy. <laughs> These are some examples of our great parenting moments. Another one was when we were trying to teach her to ride a bike at 10. The only way we could get her to try was to threaten to take away books. <laughs> Another great parenting. <laughs> Another one is, um, as she got a little older, we would, um, like the kids, usually when they get in trouble, they get grounded from friends. And we would, we would ground Jen to friends. We would say, you're grounded. You need to leave the house and go find a friend. As a result, after all the praise and maybe some identifying as a bookworm, the next year she chose not to get any points. Satan <laughs> doesn't want us to feel confident or accept compliments or feel like we're accomplishing things. It tells us not to believe others when we're trying to build others who are trying to build us up and lift us. Genevieve was so excited to play the cello in fifth grade. She brought the paper home and on the back, she calculated out exactly how much it would cost, how much money she had and how much money she needed to earn and came to me with it and said, mom, I want to play. How can I earn money? She had all the details listed out. Well, while learning how to play the cello, she realized that it didn't come easy, like all of her other schooling. The cello challenged her, and she felt inadequate and chose to stop. During COVID, the isolation definitely made us all feel more lonely. Human connection is hard to measure, which makes it hard to detect its absence. It's, it isn't a number of bars that you can see on someone's arm or forehead. But for some of us, it, it is as important as eating or drinking. I think we turn to screens way too much for school and, and the way to interact with other people. As parents, we had to change our rules about screen time. She was always on the device talking to her friends and we didn't want to take that away from her. Come Follow Me is a home study guide that our church has provided for us. Each night before bed, we study this as a family. Not perfect, but to the best that we could. <laughs> Part of this week's outline was about same-sex attraction, the divine plan of happiness, and families can be united eternally. Our last night with Genevieve, we watched a movie that was part of the outline. And I lost my spot. <laughs> um, it was part of the lesson about how a family of five were in a car accident, which three of them were killed. The oldest son and the dad were the only survivors. The message was one of hope, faith, 
and that they knew their families would be together again after the video. Genevieve said the family prayer, and we all headed off to bed. This was the last precious moment we spent with her. She had a testimony of the temple, tithing, daily scripture study, keeping a journal, and attending church. Genevieve was our only child to break both arms, as Jackson mentioned on a slide and falling off a church stage. One time we knew it hurt, but had no idea it was broken. He didn't believe me it was broken. It was broken. <laughs> so to prove it was broken, we... We made her play leapfrog, patty cake, <laughs> and waited a whole day before we got x-rays and found out it was indeed broken. <laughs> Even though it was broken on the inside, um, it appeared fine on the surface. We wish we could have had an x-ray to see what was going inside, going on inside of Jen. Um, Elder Redland, one of the, the 12 apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I was teaching in a training suicide about suicide. He said, I, I believe that the mass, the vast majority of cases will find that these individuals have lived heroic lives and that this, and that suicide will not be the defining characteristic of their eternities. He also said, know that you are loved, valued, and respected. Talk to somebody. You don't need to suffer alone. We love you and we need you, end quote. I wanna to add to that keeping it in, keeping it in is so easy at times, but we need to let it out. Letting it out will bring truth and light to it and we'll let us start the healing process. In a discussion um, with that training, Rodolfo Bertrand, whose Carlos son took his own life, says he used, he used to think suicide was only affects families with big problems. And now he knows suicide can affect anybody. We can learn how to talk about it. We need to understand that mental illness is just like having any other illness. And in, re in trying to write an obituary, we had this dilemma. We found, I, I of course, hadn't written an obituary. Um, and there was examples of do you, do you tell people that they committed suicide or not? And and I thought, you know, there's it, there's no reason to hide it. If you're feeling that way, tell people. <laughs> it's kind of, a, kind of a tab. Maybe it used to be a taboo subject and that I hope that anyone would reach out for help if you're feeling those. You're loved by so many more than what those voices in your head are telling you. We've come to the realization that it would, have, would be better to spend more time with kids instead of acting like CSI and trying to figure out why tragedies happened in the past and after the fact. We're busy with jobs, callings, friends, sports. We can all name millions of things we're busy doing. Um, I worked late the last two nights and then stopped at places on the way home. Like Genevieve, I get caught up in worrying about others and maybe not taking care of myself on the inside or taking care of family, my family as much as I should. A few months ago, we went to the Alex Boyer suicide prevention night, but the teenagers didn't want to go. I know hindsight's 2020. We had no idea of Genevieve's struggles. Should we force our kids to do things with us? <laughs> Isn't it normal teenage behavior to pull away from parents because they're not cool anymore? <laughs> a friend recently suggested taking our children um, for a drive where they're a captive audience. 
There's nowhere to escape. Leave the cell phone home. <laughs> she is beautiful. I don't know if she believed that she was. Um, I wish I had known how lonely she felt. I could have shared my own experiences of feeling lonely in high school or some of my best friends moved away and I felt like I was alone. Um, but did I share that with Jen? Did I know how she felt? I wish I'd listened more and found more clues of her internal struggles. Uh, junior high is such an awkward time when people are trying to figure out who they are, how to hide the braces, how they identify, and how they want to become. But there is hope. Um, I was, believe it or not, I was pretty shy as a kid in junior high and high school. <laughs> um, but I think after my mission, I learned to open up and, and <laughs> have been blessed with my friends. <laughs> I found a, a quote in Genevieve's um, quote notebook. It said, man can live about 40 days without food and about three days without water. About eight, eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. Her thoughts she wrote below said hope is a lifeline. So grab it. And in the Book of Mormon, the prophet Nephi wrote about hope. He said, wherefore, you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if you shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, you shall have eternal life. Genevieve loved her fellow men, friends. And she was so courteous and kind, even in her note to us. And this was on her in her room in her wall. And it's a little girl in the Savior, and she's holding a candle. And I don't know why I noticed the candle when I walked into the room. But Genevieve was a candle just, I hope, to so many. Yeah, I thought of, do we have everyone stand up that? Sure, it's, it's our funeral. Oh, okay. It's her funeral, but like, yeah, we gotta do what we want. Yeah. If, she, <laughs> if she blessed your life in any way, um, we'd like to see you stand up and show that she, that she has affected you in some way. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to us. I know the outpourings of, of love have been tremendous. I think the, the detectives at our house, they've never seen such an outpouring of friendship and love from neighbors, and friends, and family. Jenna was a little mother hen. She babysat, cooked, and cared for her siblings, Jerick and Juliet. Jackson was her best buddy. Our friends often complimented, commented on how close their relationship was and how fun it was to see them interact. No matter who was over, they would be wrestling on the couches and teasing each other and were a little inappropriate at our house, so we like to... Art on each other's heads. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Je the Savior gave the ultimate sacrifice, and that because of him, we will be resurrected and be with Genevieve and our Heavenly Father again. And since her death, I have felt like I'm learning more and more about my daughter every minute. I've seen many tender mercies, and I have felt lifted up by the support of all of you. 
and my moments of deepest sorrow and regret. <laughs> I've often felt myself shaking and wailing. And then the thought comes to me, peace, be still, or be still and know that I am God. At times I want to look at everything she left behind and try to see where I went wrong. I know that that's not going to change what's happened. Oh, I know where she is. I know she's at peace. We love you, Genevieve. We know you're in good hands. We've had a, a lot of tender mercies and people sending us words of support and love. And um, this was said to us by many people. And it was perfect. We would like to share it with you guys. So last year, People talk about grief, pain, fear, sorrow. All of these words I can't really describe that feeling when they get people lost in them. And even though we held on to hope that from the sun I'll see where again, it was just a brutal time right this is pretty hard to celebrate. And then I found this song. It was just this video on Facebook by this Christian artist who was singing about the very strong moments. As my wife and I listened to the words of this song, they expressed exactly what we were And it also so many struggles and losses in the If you are missing someone this Christmas, Oh, 
Okay. No, it's not a church hymn or anything, but we thought that song was perfect for us and for our, the situation. Uh, we're sad we're not with her. But, um, <laughs> we, know, we know she's with, she, we know she's with her Heavenly Father and with the Savior. And she knows that we'll be together again and that she said don't come too soon we know that we will see her again and we can feel feel the, the, the comforting love of the savior when we pray and ask for ask for those things and thank you so much for all of your support and the love we felt from you And uh, we, we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, early this morning, I came here to the stake center to open it. Um, I had the chance to just quietly walk down the hall. Um, um, and you see all the beautiful pictures and artwork and all the family, the wonderful experience you guys had together with Jeremy. And it caused me to think about a wonderful gift our Heavenly Father gives us um, that sometimes we don't think about. Um, and it's a gift of remembering memories. And um, it caused me to ponder this morning about that. Um, 
<clears throat> so often we think of memories, things that help us, and it's critical in our life, memories are, to remember things. There's been many times my wife is reminding me to stop on the way home from work to the grocery store, and inevitably I've forgotten many times. Um, remember, you leave for work or you're going on a trip and did you shut the garage door? Did I remember to do that? Or do I remember where my keys are? There's lots of things that also are memories help us, counsels us, reminds us of past mistakes we've made, reminds us to, of our weaknesses and things that can help us to avoid those again. But also, in this time, I'm grateful for memories. And it's interesting how things trigger us to remember. Um, it can be the color purple. Maybe the one we see that color reminds us of someone we love. Or Italian food, or Reese's peanut butter cups, or Oreos, or things like that that can help us remember, bring back memories. And that's something I think we can cherish that connects us with those that we love is our memories. So as I thought about what to share, um, it's difficult questions that come to mind. Not understanding the struggles that Genevieve had. The answers that we look for, sometimes we can't find for quite some time, or maybe we never do find the answers as to why in this lifetime. But I do want to share six things that I do know. First is I know that God lives, that all of us are his sons and daughters. Genevieve is a choice daughter of our Heavenly Father. Second, a quote from Elder Dieter F. Uchtdorf said that though we aren't complete, God loves us completely. Though we aren't perfect, he loves us completely. Though we may feel lost and without compass, God's love encompasses us completely. He loves us because he's filled with infinite measure of holy, pure, and indescribable love. We are important to God, not because of our resume, but because we are his children. He loves every one of us, even those who are flawed, rejected, awkward, sorrowed, or broken. Because of this, I know that God loves Chris and Ashley, Jackson, Genevieve, Jerry, Jerrica, and Juliet. Because, I, because of this, I know look, God loves all of us. Number three, I know that because of his great love for us, that he's given us a perfect plan of salvation, which provides us a pathway back to our Heavenly Father. Number four, I know that God is, I'm sorry, I know that Jesus is the Christ and our Savior and Redeemer. Number five, I know that because he was the son of God in the flesh, that he overcame death and provided the way for all of us to be resurrected and live again. And number six, I know that because he atoned for our sins, we can all be forgiven and washed clean. My message today is for the Bracken family and the friends of Genevieve, and really for each one of us. Well, preparing my, my thoughts today, I came across the experience of a young Latter-day Saint who shared that when she was 16, she went through a similar tragedy. And she wrote the following experience after losing her sister. And I felt it was appropriate at this time to share what she went to and how she was able to come to terms with what's happened. She said, I had a testimony of the gospel, which is supposed to keep people happy all the time, right? But it's hard to be happy when a heavy weight crushes your heart, when smiling is superficial and laughter never quite reaches your soul. Sometimes grinning and bearing it isn't an option. There are some challenges too large, some wounds too deep. Patience wears thin, then runs out. When I came to this point, my only option was to turn to my Savior, and somehow he saved me. Slowly but surely, I found healing in the atonement of Jesus Christ. And that healing began with feeling that he understood me and that I was never alone. He loves me. He loves my sister and my family. And we'll all work out. His love inspired me to love better, 
to find beauty in the ashes. My anger dissipated and was replaced with empathy and understanding toward those who suffer with depression and for families left behind. I discovered that tears are therapeutic, even five years later. Healing isn't a one and done experience. Sometimes trials don't last, but a small moment. Sometimes they last for the rest of our mortal lives. The why questions, why me, why us, and the will questions, will it ever stop hurting? Will we really be reunited? Never quite dissipate, but the seemingly unending struggle has changed me. She continued and shared a quote from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, who described long-term trials in this way. Among the quality of a saint is the capacity to develop patience and to cope with the things that life inflicts upon us, to endure, to be patient in the midst of affliction. In the midst of being misunderstood, in the midst of suffering, that is sainthood. And she concluded her message by saying, my experience has taught me that we should never stop walking simply because we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. For one day, God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. So Chris... Ashley, Jackson, Jerrica, and Juliet, I want to tell you, through my own personal experiences, when I've needed him the most, I found that our Savior has an unlimited abundance of love and compassion for each one of us. Elder Brent uh, Nelson gave the following example, and I never thought of it this way This uh, in the Bible, this uh, experience the Savior had until I read this, um, his message. He said in John chapter 6 of the New Testament, the Savior performed a most interesting miracle. With just a few fish and a few loaves of bread, the Savior fed 5,000. He said, I've read this account many times, but there's a part that, of that experience I missed that now has great meaning to me. After the set, fa Savior fed 5,000, he asked his disciples to gather up the remaining fragments, the leftovers, which filled 12 baskets. I have wondered why the Savior took time, took the time to do that. He said, it became clear to me that one lesson we can learn from that occasion was that was this. He could feed 5,000 and there were leftovers. My grace is sufficient for all men. The Savior's redeeming and healing power can cover any sin, sin, wound, or trial, no matter how large or how difficult. And there are leftovers. His grace is sufficient for each one of us. For the Bracken family and Genevieve's friends, I want you to know that our Savior Jesus Christ will never run out of love and compassion and grace to help you heal your broken heart. It is through his atonement that families can be together forever. And with that knowledge, you can move forward with faith, knowing that difficult times come. The Savior stands with open arms, inviting you to come with him. Most often we think of the purpose of the atonement of our Savior Jesus Christ was to suffer for and pay the price for our sins, which is true. But it's equally important to remember that his suffering in Gethsemane and again on the cross also included experiencing the pain and agony and sorrow that we would experience in this life. Elder David A. Bednar said, there is no physical pain, no spiritual wound, no anguish of soul or heartache. No infirmity or weakness you or I can ever confront mortality that the Savior did not experience first. In a moment of weakness, we may cry out, no one knows what it's like. No one understands. But the Son of God perfectly knows and understands. For he has felt and borne our individual burdens. And because of his infinite and eternal sacrifice, he has perfect empathy and can extend to us his arm of mercy. He can reach out, touch, succor, heal, and strengthen us to be more than we could ever be, and helps us to do that which we could never do, relying upon, only upon our own power. Indeed, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I know that as we reach out to the Savior for peace and comfort, our hearts can begin to heal and our burdens can be made light. In closing, I want to share um, a message for, for all of us from President Russell M. Nelson, his most recent video broadcast, if you saw that. A quote, he said, I invite you to make room in your heart for those around you who may be struggling. 
to see the light of the Savior and to feel his love. No gift will, will mean as much as acts of pure love you offer to the lonely, to the worn down, and the weary. And I would add to those in mourning. These, these gifts that remind us and them of the true reason for the season, the gift of God's Son, Jesus Christ, who was born to cast out all fear and to bring everlasting light and joy to all who follow him. I again know that God lives, and I know that Jesus is the Christ because of this. As Chris mentioned in his testimony that families are together forever. We can be sealed. It's part of his perfect plan is that through this life that the things we can look forward to are far greater to the experiences we have in this life. Far greater things await us with our families in the eternities. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On behalf of the family, I would like to thank all of you for your attendance, and for those who have provided the flowers, for those who have opened their homes to families coming from out of town, and for the sympathy and love that have been shown and expressed by so many. I also want to thank, thank those who have been part of this service in this service for the music, the message, and thoughts that were shared. I want to thank also the Smithfield 18th Ward Relief Society, also the young women, the 18th Ward, Sunrise Elementary, uh, 15th Ward, and many others that I I'm sure I can't list that have helped support the Bracken family today. And <clears throat> the pallbearers for this program, uh, sorry, for this service are Jackson Bracken, Adriel Bracken, John Bracken, Nathan Bracken, and Robert Hall, Tim Hodges, Tyson Hodges, Teddy Hodges. Davy Hall and Tyler Hall. And the honorary pallbearers are Stephen Bracken, Bill Hodges, Jake Villa, Brandon Larson, David Vick, Allie Hodges, Leah Villa, and Catherine Bracken. Interment will be at the Smithfield Cemetery on 300 Easton Center Street. And we ask you to please drive carefully since there won't be a, an escort of procession. Following the interment, there will be a family dinner for members of the family and invited guests. It will be served back here at the Stake Center. Um, our closing hymn will be a child's prayer, and then the benediction will be offered by Stephen Bracken, a grandfather. And then following the benediction, we'd ask the pallbearers to please come up to the front and for the uh, congregation to please rise while the family exits the chapel. The third verse of this song is a duet of the first two verses. We'd like to invite the women to sing the first verse, the men will sing the counter of the second verse.
Our dearest Heavenly Father, we have felt thy spirit here today. Enjoy and rejoicing in the life of this precious daughter of the Genevieve has we have heard has lived that life of love and inclusion that same characteristic that Christ ex exhibited while he was here on the earth He didn't go to the rich and powerful. He taught the poor, the sick, the humble. We humbly ask that the spirit of this meeting could sink deeply into our soul. And help us feel thy comforting power that is so tender and so precious. We know that his he, that Genevieve, has been received into the arms of her grandparents and her great-grandparents and her great-great-grandmothers who have reached out and hugged her as we have hugged each other today and comforted her. We know she is in a peaceful place. And she is in the heart of our Savior. He knows that Jen has returned to his presence and will take good care of her. And now we ask a blessing on all of us that we might take the lessons and the impressions that we have felt here today that have said to our hearts, we can do better. We can try just a little harder to be like her and like the We know that the Chris is a good father. And he will have the blessing and opportunity to not only raise his wife, But to raise little Jen on that glorious day when we're called home to all meet together in the heavens 
with all of his righteousness. Christians who have tried to live a Christ-like life. In that day, I feel prompted to bless Chris that he will feel a completeness of the joy of being a cadet to this wonderful child. As he brings her from the grave, <laughs> to the glory that she will deserve, I pray that she will be taught by her. Loved ones on the other side of the veil, all the things she needs to do to prepare for that wonderful day when we're all returned to each other. We say these things humbly in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>